The role of viruses within big history is an important issue. However, it is not yet extensively studied. This is due both to the fact that viruses, being microscopic infectious agents, have left limited physical traces in the geological record, and that there is no firm agreement on the place of viruses in evolution. In this report, we'll explore the role of viruses in the context of evolutionary development within the framework of big history. It aims to provide an overview of current perspectives and challenges associated with understanding the position of viruses in the broader narrative of evolutionary history. So, what are viruses? Even though we hear about viruses daily, it is not easy to define what a virus is. A classical definition of a virus is that it is a submicroscopic infectious agent that replicates only inside the living cells of an organism. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a virus is any of a large group of submicroscopic infectious agents that are usually regarded as non-living, extremely complex molecules. Agents is an oft-used term in virology, since it's hard to find a common word for viruses. A virus is not an organism, as we used to understand it, nor a chemical compound because of its very complex structure and behavior. One of the biggest problems regarding understanding viruses is that they are very different from everything we know. For evolution theory, viruses are also a problem. They are like a piece of a puzzle that does not fit into the whole picture. What we understand, and what is hard to comprehend at the same time, is that there is an unimaginably huge number of viruses, likely more than stars in the universe. How many is that? Astronomers estimate that the universe could contain up to one septillion stars, which in numbers is 10 to the 24th power an estimated 10 nonillion, 10 to the 30th power, individual viruses exist on our planet, enough to assign one to every star in the universe millions of times over. The number is so big that our brain is incapable of understanding it. Undoubtedly, viruses are the most widespread agents on Earth. However, today only over 6,000 virus species have been described in detail. Speaking about the widespread of viruses, Many people don't realize that the absolute majority of viruses on Earth are marine viruses, the diversity of which is almost astronomic. A teaspoon of seawater typically contains about 50 million viruses. Most of these viruses are bacteriophages, which infect and destroy marine bacteria and control the growth of phytoplankton. Viruses are not only the most widespread, but also the most changeable among all known forms of life. The presence of viral diversity and its importance is highlighted by the observation that every new sequenced virome includes new sequences. Like every new wave on the seashore, every virus is different from the other. At the same time, viruses prove not only that they are very widespread, but also demonstrate a great diversity in size. There are smaller viruses, for example MS2, the size of which is about 27 nanometers. Other viruses, such as the mimivirus, are so big that they are actually larger than some of the smallest cells we know. Probably the most debatable question about viruses is whether they are alive or not. Viruses are often considered non-living because first they do not have the metabolic activity that is required to maintain cellular structures, and second they cannot reproduce without a host organism. The seemingly simple question of whether or not viruses are alive raises a fundamental issue. What exactly defines life? A precise scientific definition of life is an elusive thing, but most observers would agree that life includes certain qualities in addition to an ability to replicate. A living entity is an state bounded by birth and death. Living organisms are thought to require a degree of biochemical autonomy, carrying on the metabolic activities that produce the molecules and energy needed to sustain the organism. On the other hand, not all living cells have metabolic activity. Many include potential dormant states that are practically considered alive, but are no less inert than viral particles outside their hosts. In these dormant systems, no growth or detectable metabolism will take place over very long periods of time. Are these dormant agents alive? For example, a seed or spore. A seed might not be considered alive, yet it has the potential for life and it may be destroyed. In this regard, viruses resemble seeds more than they do leaf cells. They have a certain potential, which can be snuffed out, 
but they do not attain the more autonomous state of life. Considering reproduction, it is even more complicated, since there are different types of reproduction. But it will also be a mistake to argue that every organism is independent in propagation, since sexual reproduction intrinsically needs another organism for genetic exchange. We will see below that there is a reason to believe that the cell nucleus itself is of viral origin, which means that reproduction emerged as an isolated system. According to the generally accepted definition, a virus is an obligate intercellular parasite. Although it is not exactly so, viruses maintain many kinds of relationships with their hosts, from mutualism to pure parasitism. A parasite usually uses the host for resources, typically food, and doesn't need the host in order to replicate. Viruses don't need any food. They use the host for replication. Viruses are only active while intercellular. This means that they are inside the cells of a body, taking control of what cells mechanism and stealing its energy. There is another important question. Can we define an organism as a parasite that does not harm its host? We believe it's more reasonable to see such relation as cooperation. A possible surprise to most people and perhaps to most evolutionary biologists as well is that most known viruses are persistent and innocuous, not pathogenic. According to some data, only one virus of 20 is infectious. Viruses take up residence in cells, where they may remain dormant for long periods or take advantage of the cell's replication apparatus to reproduce at a slow and steady rate. These viruses have developed many clever ways to avoid detection by the host immune system. Essentially, every step in the immune process can be altered or controlled by various genes found in one virus or another. Although there is a dualistic question, are viruses parasites or not, any parasite, as do any other organism, originates from the emergence of their replicators. With the virus being a possible source of the genetic material for all other organisms, can we really oppose viruses to more complex parasites? In fact, viruses can have beneficial effects on their hosts, creating a symbiotic relationship. And this might be far from anecdotic. Many examples of viruses that provide functional benefits to their hosts are known to create a mutualistic type. Other remarkable examples include a long-term coevolution between a large class of viruses, for example, the polydenoviruses, and their host wasps. These wasps are parasitoids. They are different from standard predators, since they lay their eggs inside the larva of their prey species, which develop inside the body of the living larva by eating them from inside. The normal outcome of this should be an immune response capable of encapsulating and injecting eggs and inhibiting egg development. However, the endogenous virus carried by the wasp egg suppresses this response. The coevolutionary ties are very strong and some authors have questioned how appropriate it is to consider the polydenovirus as a real virus. Evolution of viruses Viruses have shaped the evolution of cells, organisms, ecosystems, and even the biosphere. From an evolutionary perspective, self-replication become one of the most important landmarks of life. We know that viruses are non-cellular structures, composed of pieces of DNA or RNA surrounded by a slim coating of proteins. Although all living organisms on the globe have a DNA genome, viruses are the only organisms that still employ RNA as a genome. This can mean that viruses could have separated from DNA organisms or preceded them. Viruses are the quintessence of genetic information. It is their main and often only function with incredible variability. Just as within the web of life, viruses directly exchange genetic information with living organisms. Genetic information is a key part of understanding viruses. From the energetic point of view, viruses are an important part of information and energy flows. They strongly influence energy flows in complex ecosystems. Viruses live at the age of disorder, where high instability but also adaptability occur. Viruses are probably one of the main sources of mutation in organisms and thus a locomotive of entire evolution. As we know, mutation is a crucial component of evolution as genetic variability is the fuel of which natural selection operates to adapt populations to their environment. Viruses are found infecting all forms of life and have probably been around since the first cells arose, or perhaps even before them. 
tracking back the origin of viruses is a titanic, almost impossible endeavor because they do not form fossils. Viruses are perhaps the first organisms which develop a reproduction mechanism up to the level which is capable of life. The amazing diversity of reproductive mechanism among viruses is evidence of specialization of viruses on reproduction issues. Here are the most famous theories of the origin of viruses. The regressive hypothesis, which suggests that viruses may have once been small cells that parasitized larger cells. As time went on and the parasite became more dependent on the host cells to complete its life cycle, genes not strictly necessary for the acquired parasitism were lost. Vagrancy hypothesis, or the escape hypothesis. The second classic hypothesis for the origin of viruses states that some viruses may have evolved from pieces of DNA or RNA that escapes from the genomes of cells. The escaped DNA could have come from plasmids, pieces of naked DNA that can move between cells, or from transposons, molecules of DNA that replicate and move around the cellular genomes to different positions. Protobiont hypothesis. This is also called the virus-first hypothesis and suggests that viruses may have evolved from complex molecules of protein and ribonucleic acids at the same time as cells first appeared on Earth and would have been dependent on cellular life from the very beginning. In the primitive, precellular soup, as in any other replicating systems, parasites would have also evolved that grew at the expense of other more complex molecular systems. Some researchers think that the cell nucleus itself is of viral origin. The advent of the nucleus, which differentiates eukaryotes, including humans from prokaryotes, such as bacteria, cannot be satisfactorily explained solely by gradual adaptation of prokaryotic cells until they became eukaryotic. Rather, the nucleus may have evolved from a persisting large DNA virus that made a permanent home within prokaryotes. As a complex system, viruses are similar to other complex systems. For example, computer viruses are similar to biological ones and not only in names. Similarly, in the same way that flu viruses cannot reproduce without a host cell, computer viruses cannot reproduce and spread without a file or a document. While some computer viruses can be playful in intent and effect, other can have profound and damaging effects. This includes erasing data or causing permanent damage to your hard disk. Worse yet, some viruses are designed with financial gains in mind. Viruses can hide, disguised as attachments or socially shareable content, such as funny images, greeting cards, or audio and video files, and replicate themselves by modifying other computer programs and inserting their own code. Both biological and computer viruses are capable of mutations. However, we know that most mutations affecting a virus genome are harmful, impending or threatening their replication potential. How many mutations in man-made counterparts are lethal? None. Thus, there is a sharp separation between these two types of viruses, and Darwinian natural selection doesn't work within computer viruses as it does in nature. To make this even more unexpected, Let's discuss the fact that viruses are a complex system not only biological and chemical in nature. They are incredibly creative and can even use mechanical tools to infect the organism. Here, the DNA of a virus becomes more flexible. It has more of a fluid character. As a result, it's more likely to be injected, like toothpaste out of a tube. Here we see viruses having receptors for different surfaces of the cell. Here are complementary receptors. Here, a virus creates mechanisms to deform membrane and to provide a space to insert its RNA into a cell. And here we see bacteriophage injecting RNA into a cell like a syringe. Viruses in big history Despite the fact that viruses are tiny objects, their role in big history may be larger than it might be expected. First, they show that not everything within big history has similar patterns and fits into one narrative. Secondly, they demonstrate that even such basic phenomena as life, death, reproduction, parasites, and others are in fact very conditional. Viruses, as a transitional link between all these phenomena, show that reality is much more diverse and complex. In evolutionary phases of big history, we place them between chemical, abiogenic, and biological phases. Viruses also demonstrate involvement in the evolution of all types of organisms as well as all basic principles of evolution such as diversity, specialization in others, 
the role of viruses in evolution is obviously underestimated. A breakthrough in virology in the coming decades could be no less important as a breakthrough in understanding the nature of bacteria, both pathogenic and beneficial. Viruses are an important component from the perspective on information evolution, because in some respect, viruses can be regarded as being pure information particles. Viruses can be considered the basic information agents that transmit genetic information, serve as a resource for mutations, and thus are the basic molecular tool of evolution. Moreover, this tool is beginning to be used by humans for the genetic alteration of many organisms, including ourselves. Viruses are self-regulating systems, similar to many other complex systems. This highlights the remarkable similarities among these systems and explores potential explanations from these similarities. An integrated approach to the study of self-regulating systems can become key in the study of the interconnections and directions of the history. Thank you for your attention.